Um, my name's Emmanuel, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to Finnegan's webcast titled Recent IPR and District Court Litigations in the Life Sciences. Like I said earlier, my name is Emmanuel Onoche, and I am an associate at um, Finnegan's DC office, and I'll be a moderator for today. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome our presenters, Justin Hasford and Matthew Valenka. I'm going to give a quick introduction of, um, of their practices and who they are. Um, Justin Hasford is a partner in the DC office um, with experience in all areas of um, intellectual property law. Uh, his practice focuses on conflicts, um, patent litigation at the trial and, app and appellate levels, um, which typically arises from abbreviated new drug application or ANDAs um, under the Hatch-Waxman Act. Um, and Matthew Halinka is, uh, is an associate in the DC office. Um, and he focuses on patent and trade secret litigation before the US District Court, and primarily in the areas of pharmaceuticals and um, chemical products. Um, so before I turn things over to our presenters, I'd like to invite everyone to participate by submitting questions. Um, this is an interactive um, webinar, so if you click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the webcast interface, you should be able to type in your questions into the Q&A window. And once you have your question typed in, you can go ahead and, and click submit. And it should submit it to one of us to be able to read it. Um, it is um, 2023 and we all communicate with emojis and emoticons these days. So we also encourage you to use the emoticon, um, emoticons, which, are, um, which should be in the same interface below in order to interact with us. Um, just on the technical side, if anyone is experiencing any technical difficulties, please don't hesitate. Um, and please click on the web the webcast help guide button in the lower center of the webcast interface. Um, and now, um, without further ado, I'll turn things over to our presenters to begin the presentation titled Recent IPR and District Court Litigations in the Life Sciences. And I'd like to welcome Justin and Matt. The floor is yours. All right, well, thanks very much, Emmanuel, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, we've got uh, four cases that we're going to talk to you about today. So if we go to slide four, um, this is a brief overview of the agenda. We've got the Janssen v. Milan case, um, the Spectrum v. Longhorn case, the Bard v. Angie Dynamics case, and the Genus v. Indurain case. I'll uh, take the first two, and then Matt will take um, the remaining two cases. So let's go ahead then to slide five, um, and we can get started um, with the Janssen v. Mylan case. So a um, little bit of background about this case. So this case was just um, the uh, trial decision was just handed down a couple of months ago um, by Judge Payton in the District of New Jersey um, in May, and this um, this uh, case was a Hatch-Waxman case involving um, the drug uh, Invega Trinza. It's an FDA-approved, three-month-long um, acting injectable, and the active ingredient here is paliperidone palmitate. So the three-month-long variety of that, we're going to use the, uh, in, in the opinion, it used the uh, shorthand designator PP3M. So it's an antipsychotic drug for treating schizophrenia. And Mylan filed an ANDA um, seeking to uh, market a generic copy of this drug. Um, the patented issue was Janssen's 693 patent, um, and it's directed, generally speaking, to using this PP3M dosing regimen to reinitiate patients on the PP, uh, PP3M rather, um, four to nine months after a missed dose. Um, as um, I know many of you all are, are aware, um, for um, patients suffering from schizophrenia, um, missed dosages uh, are often a problem. Um, and for um, just psychosis in general. And so um, th these patent claims are directed to um, this reinitiation process, among other things. And it uses this one month long um, injectable paliperidone palmitate um, formulation, what, what we'll call PP1M, um, followed by the PP3M. So um, in infringement and validity were both at issue here. Um, Jansen argued that Mylan's um, proposed package insert that accompanies its generic product will induce healthcare professionals and patients to infringe um, the 693 patents claims, and in particular the reinitiation regimen that is set forth in those claims. 
and Bylam argued here not infringement and invalidity on obviousness grounds. So um, let's go then to slide six um, in our presentation. And uh, the um, claim at trial was narrowed down to claim five of the 693 patent. It's a bit of a long claim, but it's worth um, going through um, uh, in some detail um, to look at what's exactly going on here. So um, it's directed to this dosage regimen. Um, administering the injectable paliperidone depot product to a patient um, in need of a treatment for one of these conditions. Um, the patient's already been treated with PP3M, and the patient had last been administered a PP3M injection four to nine months prior, and then the next scheduled maintenance dose of PP3M should be administered to the patient, um, and that comprises administering intramuscularly um, a first a reinitiation dose, excuse me, loading dose of the PP1M, and then inter administering intramuscularly again a second reinitiation dose of the PP1M on about the fourth, about the twelfth day after the administration of the first reinitiation dose, and then another intramuscular um, administration of the reinitiation dose of the PP3M um, on or about the twenty-third day to about the thirty-seventh day after administration of the second reinitiation loading dose of the PP1M, and the first and the second reinitiation loading doses and the reinitiation PP3M um, dose are selected from this table that you see copied onto slide six down there at the bottom. And so the reinitiation dose amounts here in this table and in, the, in this claim are based on the amount of the missed dose of the PP3M. So let's go then to slide seven. Um, and so what was um, Janssen's infringement position here? So Janssen's infringement position was that um, Mylan's product, if you look at um, their product uh, with their accompanying package insert, that will be approved by the FDA if their product is approved, um, is going to invariably induce healthcare providers to infringe um, the claim dosage, res dosage regimen. And so um, if you look at the asserted claims, they really comprise three steps. Step one, administering the first dose of the PP1M. Step two, administering the second dose of the PP1M four to 12 days after the first dose of the PP1M. And then third, administering the dose of the PP3M. That's going to fall 23 to 37 days, um, about that one-month time frame, after the second dose of the PP1M. So let's go then to slide eight. And um, what were um, the non-infringement arguments then that Mylan advanced in this case? Well, um, Mylan argued there's going to be no direct infringement here um, because they said uh, that the asserted claims reinitiation dosing regimen is going to be carried out by two independent actors. There's going to be the patient um, who missed the dose of PP3M and then chose to return for the treatment three more times, and then the healthcare professional who's going to administer the claim dosing regimen. Now, they also, um, Mylan also argued that really the asserted claim comprises not three steps, but seven steps. And the bolded steps are going to be performed by the patient, and the non bolded steps there on slide eight will be performed by the healthcare professional. So, Mylan said the patient is going to first miss the dose, then return for the treatment four to nine months later, then um, have the healthcare professional administer the first dose, the PP1M then return four to 12 days later um, after that first dose of PP1M, then have the healthcare professional administer the second dose of PP1M, then the patient would return for the treatment 27 to 30, 23 to 37 days rather after the second dose of the PP1M, and then the healthcare professional would administer um, the dose of the PP3M. So according to Mylan, um, that uh, would result in no direct infringement here. So let's go then to slide nine, and what did the district court have to say? Um, Judge Payton said, um, first off, Mylan's divided infringement defense here is actually untimely. Um, this is District of New Jersey, so District of New Jersey has um, uh, fairly stringent local patent rules um, that require early disclosures of both um, invalidity and non-infringement defenses in Hatch-Waxman cases. And um, Mylan did not disclose that non-infringement theory in its local patent rule contentions. 
Um, as a matter of fact, Mylan's non-infringement theory appeared for the first time in its rebuttal expert reports. Um, and so Judge Payton said, well, even if it were timely, which it's not, um, the defense still fails on the merits. So the um, Federal Circuit has held that direct infringement occurs where all the steps of the claim method are performed by or attributable to a single entity. And here Judge Payton agreed with Jansen, um, the injections comprise only three steps, and a healthcare professional um, administers each step. And the meaning here is clear. Um, the patients arrive having missed the dose, and the healthcare professionals administer the three reinitiation doses. The whole point of these patent claims is reinitiation, and the healthcare professional is administering those reinitiation doses, and those are the three claim steps. It's not seven claim steps where there's um, sort of a back and forth between the healthcare professional and the patient. It's really the three steps here is what the, 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 this patent claim is directed to. And missing the dose and returning are merely preconditions to the administration. Um, and in fact, um, Mylan's proposed package insert explicitly instructs healthcare professionals to reinitiate patients on the PP3M in an infringing manner um, by directing those healthcare professionals to, ma quote, manage missed doses. Um, and Mylan's proposed package insert also um, explicitly um, instructs that in, in two different sections of the package insert, um, further uh, supporting that Mylan has practiced um, the asserted claims here. So let's go then to um, slide 10, and, and, and Mylan's infringement um, is inducement here. Um, and Judge Payton said Mylan specifically um, intended to induce infringement, and um, consistent with those um, statements in the label that I just mentioned, uh, in Hatch-Waxman cases, induced infringement requires a showing that the proposed package inserts encourage, recommend, or promote infringement, and there are specific instructions here in Mylan's proposed package insert to establish that specific intent. So let's go on then to slide um, 11, if we can. And um, we'll go to the validity side of the case. Um, and here, Judge Payton found that Mylan failed to establish that the claims in this case would have been obvious. Um, Mylan's obviousness case um, was really just a hindsight combination of components that were pulled from the prior art to try to fit the parameters of the claim invention. Um, and hindsight, as we know um, from many cases out of the Federal Circuit, but um, uh, perhaps uh, most notably Oat Super D Sandoz, is improper and cannot form the basis for a proper um, obviousness analysis. Um, and here, Mylan actually failed to prove that every element of the asserted claims was even known in the prior art. Um, so Mylan relied on four PP1M prior art references and asserted that, well, these PP1M prior art references could be extrapolated to determine a reinitiation dosing regimen that encompasses PP3M. And, and the, the PP3M reinitiation itself was not actually taught in the prior art. And the um, court found that Mylan's expert, Dr. Forrest here, actually cherry-picked in the prior art, um, you know, where one data point didn't lead to the desired conclusion, which is the actual reinitiation regimen of the asserted claims, um, then he went and chose another that did. And, and of course, that sort of cherry picking hindsight um, uh, view toward the prior art is improper. So let's go then to slide 12. Um, and what else uh, did Judge Payton have to say about obviousness, and in particular, Mylan's case? Well, Mylan um, failed to prove that there would have been any motivation to combine the prior art to arrive at the asserted claims with any reasonable expectation of success. And, and that, of course, is um, what's required under controlling federal circuit precedent for obviousness. And so they attempted to use this extrapolation to arrive at the four to nine month window, but that simply wasn't credible and, again, um, evinced the impermissible sort of hindsight that the federal circuit um, cautioned against, you know, Super B. Sandoz and in other cases. And then um, Judge Payton noted that the 693 patent um, was uh, the first. Uh, time in which a long-acting injectable had been patented that recommended using two different long-acting injectable formulations to manage a missed dose. Um, the prior art uh, taught that if patients had a missed dose of PP1M, they were reinitialized with PP1M at the same dosage. 
Um, therefore, the asserted claims here, claim five in particular, the 693 patent, um, deviate from this common practice, further um, confirming and supporting their non-obviousness. So then let's um, go to objective indicia, and that's going to be slide 13. Um, so objective indicia of non-obviousness also supported um, the non-obviousness of this claimed invention. Um, the asserted claims here help fulfill this long-felt need that we um, touched on a bit in the prior slide for a longer second-generation long-acting injectable, where the prior art was sent to the PP1M. And then the asserted claims um, certainly contributed to commercial success, um, $2.5 billion in sales since launch in a crowded marketplace um, the, in particular drugs um, for treatment of schizophrenia. And um, physicians here, clinicians in the field, uh, frankly expressed skepticism that the claimed reinitiation regimen would actually successfully reinitiate patients um, or provide uh, the promised therapeutic benefit for the full three-month-long dosing limit. And so um, with that, the court concluded um, that the patent claims were not obvious and that Mylan's obviousness challenge failed. So then let's go to slide 14, and the next uh, portion of our presentation will be the Spectrum Solutions versus long Home Vaccines case um, from the PTAB, and this uh, decision was just handed down um, about three or four months ago. So let's go um, to slide 15 and um, discuss the uh, particulars of this case. So um, here, the, the patent claim, um, the, the, the patent issue was the 443 patent, um, and uh, Longhorn asserted this patent against Spectrum um, in an infringement case in the District of Utah. And um, after that case was filed, Spectrum petitioned for inter partes review of all 51 of the claims of the 443 patent, the PTAB. And so the 443 patent, generally speaking, is directed to um, aqueous compositions for collection, transport, storage, or biological specimen containing this population of nucleic acids in a single reaction vessel, and then they can be purified and or analyzed using conventional molecular biological methods. Um, so claim one um, in particular uh, sets forth an aqueous composition comprising A, one or more chaotropes, um, B, one or more detergents, C, one or more reducing agents, D, one or more chelators, E, one or more, and E, one or more buffers. And together, these need to be present in an amount sufficient to denature proteins, inactivate nucleases, kill pathogens, and not degrade, while not degrading, the nucleic acid of a sample suspected of containing the pathogens um, when the sample is contacted with the composition. So um, basically helping um, work up these samples in a way that allows them to still be analyzed um, without destroying the analyte but, but while um, uh, denaturing and activating and, and so forth um, the undesired components. And um, upon uh, filing of the IPR and consideration of it, the PTAB instituted trial on all the claims on the basis of obviousness. So then let's go to slide 16 and um, talk about the uh, um, specific grounds for obviousness. And so the PTAB found that claim one was obvious over the burn boy. So Bernboim teaches preserving nucleic acids from a bacteria or a virus, um, teaches using chaotropes, detergents, reducing ag agents, chelators, and buffers in a one-step aqueous composition, um, also teaches employing a combination of well-known components and using them in accordance with well-understood functions, that is, denaturing proteins, killing pathogens, and preserving nucleic acids, all to yield predictable results. And so Bernborn teaches, therefore, all five of the general categories um, or the reagents um, recited in the claims and teaches using all of these reagents together to perform their recited functions. And so the PTAB um, uh, quoted the phrase, combining te teachings in a single prior art reference does not require a leap of inventiveness. And um, also noted that the patent owner here did not present any objective indicia of non-obviousness. So let's go then to slide um, 17. So um, Longhorn, a uh, patent owner, filed a motion to exclude the Birdborn reference, the primary prior art reference, and then certain um, test results from ABL, which is a third-party lab that was actually engaged by Longhorn itself, 
and um, deposition transcripts of three ABL employees. So they, they employed this um, third-party testing lab to help um, obtain data that would support um, their, their position here, their case, and so they filed um, this motion to exclude, um, and that's on slide 17. So let's then go to slide 18. Um, and uh, what did um, they argue about um, Bernboim? Well, they argued that the petitioner shouldn't be able to rely on Bernboim's specification to prove the truth of the testing data in that specification without some sort of affidavit from someone um, with firsthand knowledge of the experiments, um, basically uh, a hearsay sort of argument. And the board rejected that argument, um, and, it, and the board said that the petitioner is entitled here to rely on Bernboin to prove what its specification describes, and that's permitted under um, the regs under 37 CFR 42.61C. So let's go then to um, slide 19 and, um, the, uh, and, and talk about the ABL test results. So again, Longhorn sought to... Um, to exclude those um, and the deposition transcripts. So the ADL witnesses originally testified at their depositions that here they didn't do any other testing for Longhorn that was considered in the testing report, um, and also no other testing existed related to the conclusions or results presented in the testing report. Um, well, the problem was the deposition transcripts um, showed that Longhorn really attempted to cabin the witnesses here to only the explicit disclosure of the testing report. Um, and the board um, then ordered the production of any relevant inconsistent information. And so Longhorn responded that, well, any other work done by ABL that wasn't explicitly disclosed in this particular testing report qualifies as work product. And there is um, case law in district court cases um, that does suggest that a party um, that conducts analytical testing or other testing in connection with a litigation um, may choose to, dis to um, or may attempt to argue that they can withhold that information as a work product, um, but it certainly can't be used as a sword and a shield. Um, but here, um, the, uh, the, the PTAB rejected that argument. So let's go to slide um, 20 if we can. And so um, what did the board say here? Um, Longhorn hasn't sufficiently explained why these test results that support its arguments aren't protected under any privilege, but the results from the test that contradict its, are, its position are protected under some sort of privilege or work product immunity. And um, Longhorn here tested one theory, um, and their theory was that Bernboim wouldn't work the way it, it was disclosed, and then they withheld all the test results that were inconsistent with that theory. Um, and uh, the board held that because the test results uh, were relaying facts and, as opposed to mental impressions, conclusions, opinions, or legal theories of an attorney or other representative, um, they weren't going to be protected here by any sort of work product immunity. And so then let's go to slide 21. Um, and what happened as a result of this? Well, the PTAB um, issued an order of sanctions against law and war. Um, the PTAB noted that there is a high degree of candor, uh, duty of candor and good faith that's required of all attorneys, and here found that the failure of ABL to include the results that contradict their conclusion um, is really to be explained by the intervention of Longhorn's counsel. And Longhorn represented to the board that no other testing exists relating to the conclusions or results presented in the ABL report. Um, however, the board uh, believe that that uh, representation appeared to be, in the board's words, wholly untrue. And so Longhorn moved to amend. Um, they sought to substitute claims with further limitations. That motion to amend was denied. And um, Director Vidal decided to review um, the uh, decision. And um, there has been demonstration um, at, at the Patent Office uh, of an interest in enforcing compliance with the PTO and PTAB rules, including the duty of candor. So let's go on then um, to slide 22 and, and talk about um, some of the implications of this, because I think um, there's, there's some implications here that um, could potentially be far-reaching. Um, there were, of course, some unanswered questions. Um, was this a finding of inequitable conduct? Um, it does not appear to have been explicitly a finding. It was a sanctions order. Um, and, however, withholding data from the PTO that contradicts arguments um, that are made 
before the PTO can potentially lead to a finding of inequitable conduct. Now, um, does the PTAB have the authority to find inequitable conduct in an IPR? Again, that was not answered. This, again, was a sanctions order. I mean, IPRs, as we know, are limited to um, 102 and 103 grounds based on printed publications. And inequitable conduct is a uh, judicially created doctrine that's really an application of the common law doctrine of unclean hands. And um, the PTAB cited their authority to issue an order of sanctions for the misconduct, including the misrepresentation, um, but did not um, specifically address this as an inequitable conduct finding. And then another unanswered un question is, did the denial of Longhorn's motion to amend preclude the opportunity to cure um, in, in, in potentially by um, providing these data? And um, did, uh, you know, should they have, have, have been given that opportunity? Because um, there is case law dating back to the early days of the federal circuit that inequitable conduct can be cured if, First, the PTO is expressly advised of a material misrepresentation. Second, the PTO is advised of the facts and circumstances and whether further examination might be necessary. And third, establishing patentability on the basis of an accurate factual record. And as we're aware, um, the, uh, the, the AIA brought about the supplemental examination process that allows, under certain circumstances, opportunities to cure inequitable conduct. Um, inequitable conduct has been addressed in interferences, um, but, you know, it appears that this uh, decision by the PTAB and Longhorn um, is at a minimum going to mark a, uh, or, uh, a, uh, a regime by which um, there's going to be additional um, uh, um, really uh, um, uh, not just skepticism, but um, uh, perhaps view given toward um, duty of candor here. And um, by canceling these claims or, or by um, preventing, well, canceling the claims and, and precluding the motion to amend, um, the PTAB really has imposed a fairly stark punishment here, and perhaps the starkest punishment we've seen so far. And, and this, um, you know, there, as, as we all know, there's potential um, OED um, investigations in this. And uh, I think what this case um, clearly tells us is that moving forward, uh, the duty of candor um, has to be considered very carefully in all of these PTAP proceedings. And so with that, um, I'll turn it over to Matt Halinka for the next two cases in our presentation. All right, thanks, Justin. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending our webinar today. Uh, I'm Matthew Halinka. I have two cases that I'll be discussing today, uh, one from the District of Delaware and one from the PTAP. Uh, I'll start first with the CR Bard versus NGO Dynamics case from Delaware, uh, decided uh, just about a month ago. So first, let's look at the factual background in the case. Uh, so this case concerns the vascular access port. A uh, picture of it is shown here on the slide. Uh, vascular access ports are the small receptacles that are attached to a catheter uh, that's implanted under a patient's skin. Uh, they're used to ease regular medical injections. Um, been in use for, for a long time, uh, for decades, uh, to inject pharmaceutical drugs into patients. Uh, for example, you know, they're commonly used for, for chemotherapy drugs. Now, traditionally, uh, these drugs were injected into the vascular access port uh, a small amount at a time uh, and injected at low pressures or low fluid flow rates, uh, you know, traditionally done by hand. Um, however, uh, as medical technology progressed, uh, we got things like CT scans. And CT scans, you know, they added uh, this new use for these ports, uh, but that new use, new use uh, it came with some added complications. Uh, so CT scans, uh, they use these substances called uh, contrast fluids. Uh, and the contrast fluids are injected into patients uh, to, in order to improve the visibility of the CT scan. Problem is uh, that the, the contrast fluid, um, typically it's, it's very viscous, very thick. Uh, so it needs to be injected uh, very quickly into the patient. Now, uh, this injection of this very viscous fluid 
uh, couldn't really be done with the traditional method of, of injecting by hand. Uh, so in order to help out, uh, someone invented what is called a, a power injection machine. And then it, these power injection machines, uh, they're capable of injecting these viscous materials at these much higher pressures and these much higher fluid flow rates, uh, you know, basically well beyond what, what had previously been possible by hand. So that solved one problem, uh, but in doing so, it, it created another one. Uh, so these old traditional vascular access ports, you know, they weren't designed to handle those high pressures, those high flow rates. Um, it wasn't as simple as you know, the, the port would break the very first time you tried to use it with one of these power injection, injection machines. Uh, instead, it was a little more tricky. Uh, think of it more of like a, a balloon that you repeatedly inflate and deflate. Over time, it, it gradually it weakens and eventually you, you get a failure. You know, if it's a balloon, it bursts. Uh, here, you, you get a failure. Um, and that's, that's what was happening. Um, so in 2004, uh, the FDA issued this warning to doctors uh, saying that there had been over 250 different rupture events reported. Uh, basically telling them, you know, be careful, don't use these ports uh, above their, their pressure and flow ratings. So this, of course, uh, created an opportunity in the market for someone to come up with a vascular access port that was uh, approved for use with these power injection machines. Uh, and so that's exactly what BART did. Uh, they became the first to obtain approval to market a power injectable vascular access port and they got that FDA approval in July of 2006. And uh, Bard got a, a patent on their, their new uh, port uh, and uh, representative claim one, it's shown here on slide 25. Uh, and interestingly, they didn't uh, patent the port itself, but they uh, patented this system for identifying a power injectable vascular access port. And that system comprises a vascular access port uh, comprising you know, certain features. Uh, and then it's got a, a first identifiable feature incorporated into the access port, uh, perceivable following subcutaneous implantation of the access port, uh, where it comprises this radiographic marker that identifies the port as suitable for a defined flow rate. Uh, and then there's also a second identifiable feature uh, visually observable following implantation uh, to, in order to confirm that the port is suitable for that defined flow rate. Now, uh, Bard wasn't alone in seeking a power injectable port. Uh, others were working to develop their own. Uh, that includes a company called Angio Dynamics. Uh, Angio came out with their own port. Uh, then in 2015, Bard sued Angio for patent infringement, and um, they went to trial in March of 2019. At trial, uh, after Bard's infringement case in chief, uh, the court granted judgment as a matter of law in favor of Angio on both non-infringement and invalidity. And the court found that the asserted claims were invalid for reciting patent ineligible print matter no redeeming inventive concept. Uh, so Bard uh, appealed and the federal circuit um, agreed with the district court that the claims were cited generally ineligible print matter. Uh, but uh, federal circuit disagreed with the trial court's ultimate conclusions. Uh, specifically, the federal circuit found that an inventive concept could be discerned from the radiographic marker limitation. Uh, which uh, that makes the, the claimed invention particularly useful uh, by allowing it to be readily and reliably identified as suitable for power injection uh, via X-ray. So therefore, uh, the panel ruled the asserted claims um, were not patent ineligible under Section 101, and the, patent, the panel also cautioned the district court uh, against granting judgment as a matter of law before Bard was able to present its invalidity rebuttal case. 
So following that, uh, the parties reconvened for a second trial, which took place in November of 2022. Uh, and uh, as we'll see on the next slide, the trial court uh, described this trial as eventful. So now on slide 27, um, at the November 2022 trial, Bard's very first witness, who is the named inventor, Kelly Powers, uh, inventor admitted on direct examination that the novelty of the power of Bard's uh, power port product uh, lay neither in creating a power injectable port nor in making one radiographically visible. Uh, instead, he testified that uh, the patentability lie in crafting a reliable radiographic label and in tightening the manufacturing tolerances of their of BART's existing port design such that it would endure a repeated power injection and able to do so with a, a satisfactory degree of safety. Then, uh, in what the trial court called a surprise twist, uh, BART's damages expert admitted that in his reasonable royalty calculations, he had not apportioned the value imparted by each discrete aspect of the allegedly infringing products, but instead he simply imparted uh, by each discrete aspect of the allegedly infringing products. Or excuse me, he had, but, um, excuse me, he had picked a, a royalty rate based on the entire revenue of the products that seemed, uh, quote, fair to him. So, the trial court struck the entirety of the damages experts testimony and uh, in the hopes of salvaging an infringement and validity verdict they bifurcated the damages portion of the trial hoping that they could take care of that later the court also notes uh that throughout the trial bards fact and expert witnesses flouted the court's claim construction order and construed newly material terms for the first time. And the court uh, stated, you know, they tried remedial efforts, but that the, all those attempts failed. Then after deliberation, uh, the jury returned a, a blanket verdict for Bard. They found um, direct infringement, they found induced infringement, willful infringement, novelty, non-obviousness, and they also rejected Angio's prior use defense. Angio moved for judgment as a matter of law on invalidity, non-infringement, and non-willfulness. And that determination uh, is what we will look at next. So looking here at the court's opinion, uh, which was author authored by Judge uh, Battalion, uh, who is sitting by designation from the District of Nebraska. Uh, so not one of our normal Delaware judges, but always interesting to see another perspective. Um, and in his, his opinion, the, he began by emphasizing that this case really highlights the dangers of construing claim terms during discovery without the context of the party's infringement and invalidity positions. And the court noted that at claim construction, the court understood the claimed port, uh, quote, suitable uh, for power injection and, quote, identifiable as such. Um, but the, the trial testimony showed otherwise. Um, as the inventor, uh, Kelly Powers, testified, Bard's task uh, lay not in crafting a power injectable port from a, from a blank slate, but instead uh, by modifying the manufacturing tolerances of then existing ports to make them suitable for power injection. And it was important to note that previous ports had successfully endured power injection procedures and that those previous ports had failed, uh, that excuse, those previous ports that had failed had not necessarily done so the first time they were subjected to a power in injection. And the court reason that this makes sense, um, vascular access ports facilitate not just one, but repeated injections, such as you know, multiple CT scans over time in order to track a course of the treatment. And you know, the court noted that it was the repeated cycles of that power pressurization and depressurization that were stressing and wearing the port out until it inevitably fails. And they also noted that, you know, even these uh, FDA approved power injectable vascular access ports, uh, those aren't designed to last forever either. Um, they're designed to, to withstand a certain number of cycles before they need to be replaced. 
sometimes it's 10 cycles, 20, sometimes 30, but it, you know, it, there was a, a, a limit to it. And so consequently, the question was not whether a port was suitable and identifiable for power injection, but how suitable and how identifiable. Of course, this created problems at trial um, because according to the court, BARD's newly advanced constructions and the failure of the jury instructions to account for them uh, entitled Angio to a new jury. So the court was prepared to order a new trial, uh, excuse me, entitled Angio to a new trial, which the court was was uh, prepared to, to order. Um, but uh, the court believed there was a simpler path than a retrial because under BARD's newly advanced constructions, uh, the claims recited patent ineligible subject matter lacked novelty and were indefinite. So according to BARD, uh, suitable and identifiable mean safely so. And according to BARD, the problem wasn't designing a port capable of power injection. You know, those already exist in the prior art. Prior art ports could withstand those multiple power injections. The problem was that those previous ports, uh, they just weren't reliable. Some would rupture the first time, some could withstand several injections. So the problem was finding a port that could safely and reliably withstand a predictable number of power injections. And Bard's testimony showed that this was accomplished by basically just tightening the manufacturing tolerances of its existing ports. Bard then distinguished its invention from the prior art on the basis of the prior art not being sufficiently able to be reliably identified as safe. But the court says this made the claims ineligible subject matter. You know, under section 101, patents don't cover natural phenomena or abstract ideas absent some transformative addition. So Bard patented neither the, the power injection nor the design parameters of a power injection capable port also didn't patent the process to manufacture a power injectable port. Instead, it, it, it patented that system that we looked at before. And the court also noted, you know, the claims omit any reference to the, those tightened manufacturing tolerances that Bard uh, incorporated. Instead, um, by claiming terms like suitable for power injection, Bard was merely claiming the degree of safety and reliability necessary to secure FDA approval. But safety and reliability, however, are, according to the court, unquestionably abstract ideas. And the court states that the idea that the claims contain a, a transformative spark can be easily dismissed because the effort required to refine the existing structure of Bard's ports did not rise to that level. And the court also found the claims indefinite. Uh, the court said that the, pat the patents do not define what is considered safe for power injection. Um, there was testimony uh, from doctors during trials saying that they considered the prior art ports safe for injection. And um, also noted that all ports are designed with a specific lifespan. For example, uh, BARD's new ports were designed to withstand 21 power injections. But uh, you know, that lifespan, specific lifespan, it's, it's not recited in the claims. So uh, you know, the court says that the claims are defined using these subjective human judgments of risk tolerance and are therefore indefinite. The court wasn't done there either. Um, the court also found the claims anticipated, stating that under Bard's new reinterpretation of the claims, no reasonable jury could determine that the claims were not anticipated. Taken together, uh, the Bard claims recite four elements. Uh, there's a, a vascular access port suitable for power injection. There's a palpable feature. There's a radiographic feature comprising an observable pattern or symbol or the like. And there's also an external feature, uh, including an ID card, a key ring, bracelet, or similar identifier carried by the patient. And the court noted that you know no one contested that the prior art contained elements number two and four. Uh, which are a palpable feature and the external feature. But then for the, the other two elements, um, for element one, based on Bard's broad assertion of claim meaning, uh, the prior art ports were suitable for power injection. Uh, it doesn't matter that only a subset of those prior art ports proved structurally capable of repeated power injection. 
that some did was enough. And then for the third element of the claims, uh, the court found that this recited radiographic identifier uh, needed to be no more than an attribute perceivable via x-ray. And that was also found in the prior art. So uh, to sum up, the court found that the claims were anticipated as well. And so, um, yeah, so that's that's the trial court's opinion. Uh, C.R. Bard has filed a notice of appeal at the Federal Circuit. Um, you know, this is a very recent trial court opinion, so he hasn't gone anywhere yet, but it will be interesting to see uh, what the Federal Circuit does with this one. So uh, moving to slide 33, that brings us to our final case, which is Genus versus Ingeron, uh, which is a PTAB decision from a few months ago. So this case uh, involved uh, the 734 patent. Uh, 734 patent discloses methods of increasing the genetic progress of a breed or herd of swine through the use of sex-selected sperm cells and artificial insemination techniques in order to increase efficiency and quality in pork production by selecting superior genetic lines for reproduction and so the patent explained um, swine production can be represented as uh, a basically like a multi-level pyramid. You have certain offspring at each level, and these offspring are being used um, in the next lower level for breeding. Um, uh, the top level of the pyramid um, is, has what's called the nucleus, nucleus herd or the genetic nucleus. And then at the, the bottom level of the pyramid has uh, commercial farms. So the 734 patent um, describes this selection method, uh, which allows producers to increase the rate of desirable genetic change uh, in these swine breeding lines, all while um, purportedly lowering the operational cost. So claim one of the patent uh, shown here, um, you know, generally uh, it claims a method of increasing the genetic progress in swine breeds using a, a boar and a sow from a, a genetic nucleus. Boar and sow are selected based on certain genetic markers uh, desirable for breeding. And a, a semen sample is collected from the boar, which is then sorted into a, at least two subpopulations of sperm cells. Um, and then the two subpopulations, uh, wherein at least 80% of a first subpopulation bears X chromosomes or Y chromosomes. And then the sow is inseminated with cells from the first subpopulation to produce a, an offspring that is then genotyped to identify certain genetic markers. And then based on the results, uh, offspring can then be used as part of the genetic nucleus. So Ingeron uh, filed a petition for IPR and asserted that the 734 patent was anticipated and that it was obvious over the Decker's reference as evidenced by other references in the prior art. So for the anticipation argument uh, shown here, uh, petitioner argued that Decker's disclosed a three-tiered pyramid-based uh, breeding structure for animal genetics to obtain a genetic improvement. Uh, then Decker's also cited to some other references in the prior art, um, Maxwell and Garter, uh, or excuse me, Maxwell and Garner, um, which these references were cited in Decker's and they disclosed sexed chromosome sorting in swine at an 85 to 95% accuracy. And on response, uh, the patent owner, Genus, um, they argued that Decker's cannot be an anticipatory reference because it does not explicitly or inherently disclose uh, the sex chromosome sorting to an at least 80% purity level is required in the claims. But, um, you know, as, as the PTAB states, um, you know, they agreed with Genus they, and uh, that Decker's cannot be anticipatory uh, because it does not explicitly or inherently uh, disclose that element. And as the PTAB states, you know, to establish anticipation under section 102, each and every element in a claim arranged as recited in the claim must be found in a single prior art reference. Decker's did have this generic reference to Maxwell and Garner, but because it lacked any level of particularity, it wasn't a sufficient incorporation by reference. 
and the, you know, the, the PTAB even noted, you know, this is more akin to an obviousness challenge. Luckily for the petitioner, um, they did make this obviousness challenge. Uh, so we'll look at that next. Um, so yeah, here a uh, petitioner alleged that the 734 patent claims were obvious over Decker's and the other prior art references that we just discussed. Um, in its obviousness analysis, uh, petitioner noted that Decker's was not specific to swine breeding, but it disclosed the identification of ideal genetic markers in a male and female, and through artificial insemination and sex chrome sorting, the desired genetic traits trickle down into offspring populations. And, uh, you know, as discussed on the previous slide, the accuracy of the swine chromosome sorting had already been disclosed in Maxwell and Garner. So the final question for the board was whether it would have been obvious to a person of ordinary skill to utilize Deckers in light of those references. And the PTAB said yes. Uh, the board found that a person of ordinary skill would have understood the genetic nucleus of the 734 patent to align with that top tier of Deckers' uh, breeding pyramid. Plus, sex chromosome sorting, uh, which is already being used in swine breeding with an 80% accuracy rate, uh, reasonably suggested that Deckers, uh, in light of Maxwell, would utilize the sex chromosome sorting to advance the desired genetic traits arising from, from that genetic nucleus, or that, that top tier of the Deckers pyramid. So therefore, uh, PTAB held that the challenged claims of the 734 patent were unpatentable as obvious. Okay, so that wraps up our four cases for today. Um, we assembled this kind of a key webinar takeaway slide here. Um, got three of them included here on slide 37. First one, uh, obviousness is a high hurdle in the very complex pharmaceutical, uh, chemical and biotech fields. Um, you know, it can be found in some circumstances like in the genus IPR, but you know, there has to be guiding data, guiding information in the prior art when challenging the obviousness of inventions in, in these highly complex fields. Second takeaway uh, is to be uh, wary of using subjective terms in patent claims. Uh, we discussed this in the CR Bard case where they used uh, subjective terms like safe and identifiable um, then didn't provide sufficient guidance in the specification to determine what those terms meant. Um, so consequently, they, they ran into uh, an indefinite problem. Um, so, you know, to bolster the success of of surviving such a challenge uh, as a patent owner, you know, you want to make sure the intrinsic record sufficiently identifies the boundaries of the claim scope. And then finally, final takeaway uh, is to remember the anticipation standard. Uh, anticipation requires each and every element in a claim arranged as recited in the claim uh, that must be found in a single prior art reference. Uh, a patent challenger may be able to get additional references into an anticipation challenge if they can show that those additional references have been incorporated by reference, but uh, that incorporation needs to be done with particularity, um, which of course was, was not the take, or was not what happened in the genus uh, IPR we looked at. Um, when you get those multi-reference anticipation arguments, start to look more like obviousness arguments pretty quickly. Uh, so you know, a, a good idea to consider at least making that obviousness argument in the alternative. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll turn it back to Emmanuel. All right, thank you so much, Matt. And thank you, Justin, for the really enlightening and educating um, presentation. Before we begin with the questions, um, and before we begin with the Q&A portion of our event, please take a moment to complete our brief evaluation survey um, as we strive to provide programs of value and continually improve. We would appreciate your input, which will guide us in planning future programs. Okay, now, now turning to the Q and A, it's now time to address questions from the audience. I'm going to read them. Um, I'm going to read a question to Justin, a question to Matt, and we're going to alternate that way. We already have a, a few questions to ask. But um, as a reminder, um, to, to participate in the Q and A, just click the Q and A button and type your question into the Q and A window, and you click submit. All right, thanks for the emoticons. Much appreciated. Um, the first question is for Justin, and the question is, in the Jansen case, you discussed induced infringement and how that relates to the patent challenger's proposed product label. Do 
do you have any advice for how to draft a patent claim with the product label in mind? Um, y y yes, thanks, Emmanuel, and, and thanks to um, the, um, the person who asked, asked that. That's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, there's a couple of cases that come to mind. You can look at um, the AstraZeneca v. Apotex case, um, and you can look at the Sanofi v. Watson case. But the, the short answer, and I'm not trying to be flip when I say this, is um, try to draft the claim so that it tracks the language of the package insert as closely as possible. And you'll see how in those two cases, in particular in Sanofi v. Watson, they drafted the claim so that it really just tracked the language in the package insert and covered the clinical trial results um, such that infringement was um, because the, the generic was not able to carve that language out of its, its package insert. In fact, the generic wanted that language in its package insert. And, and I think the same here in, in the Janssen case about the um, dosing regimens and the, and the reinitiation. And then um, it was a little thornier in, in AstraZeneca v. Apotex in the sense that there was downward titration um, instruction that was um, perhaps less explicit in the package insert. But ultimately, um, Judge Bum in the District of New Jersey, who's now the chief judge there, and um, the Federal Circuit affirmed her, she found that, uh, that that constituted induced infringement. So um, those are two examples that I think um, are instructive to look at in terms of um, showing how uh, patent claims can be drafted to really um, as specifically as possible cover the, the, the language and the label. And it'll also help from a validity standpoint because it'll make, um, it'll make it harder for um, challenger to, to um, create a, an obviousness position based on the prior art. All right, thank you, Justin, and thank you for those two examples as well. Um, the next question is from Matt, and the question is, what is the average time to completion of completion in patent litigation? Yeah, thanks, Emmanuel. Uh, yeah, that's a, a question that um, comes up a lot. Um, the answer really is that it, it can depend on a lot of different things. Um, you know, average time to completion of patent case varies on really several factors, uh, including subject matter of the patent, where the case is filed, what judge you have, or whether it's a bench trial versus a jury trial. Uh, you know, on the, the subject matter, uh, a big determinant, you know, that Justin and I deal with a lot is whether it's a, a case that's being litigated under the Hatch-Waxman Act or not. Uh, under the Hatch-Waxman Act, uh, when a generic pharmaceutical company submits a, a paragraph four notice sued by the patent owner, that triggers what's uh, basically a 30, what's called a 30-month stay. Um, a 30-month stay uh, stays the Food and Drug Administration from uh, approving the generic company's abbreviated new drug application for 30 months. Um, so uh, in those cases, the parties, the court are, are typically pretty motivated to get the case resolved before that stay, stay expires. Uh, so those patent cases uh, usually go to trial, uh, and get an opinion within 30 months. Uh, that's definitely the goal. Um, you know, for other patent cases, uh, you know, it depends on, on the court and the judge. Um, Justin and I, we both litigate a lot of cases in Delaware, New Jersey. Uh, both of those cases, or excuse me, both of those courts uh, handle a lot of Hatch-Waxman cases. So if you just pull the, the raw data for their, you know, time to trial, I think it's right at 30 months. Um, if you parse out the data, look at only the, the non-Hatch-Waxman cases, uh, time to trial, I think, is closer to 36 months. Um, so, uh, you know, a, a little longer, but only a few months longer. But then, you know, there's other, other courts out there that are, are much faster, um, Eastern District of Virginia, known for being very quick. I think average time to trial there is right around 18 to 20 months, uh, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, so uh, kind of a long way to say it, it depends on a lot of factors. Uh, ballpark, usually about 30 to 36 months. All right, thank you, Matt. Um, it depends is always the answer. <laughs> um, um, this, the next question is for Justin, and the question is, what is the difference between the analysis of obviousness and the analysis of obviousness type double patent? Uh, yeah, and, and, and that's another good question. So obviousness is purely a statutory um, analysis based on 35 U.S.C. Section 103, and, and the statute says um, 
a, a patent for a claimed invention may not be obtained, notwithstanding that the claimed invention is not identically disclosed um, as set forth in Section 102, if the differences between the claimed invention and the prior are such that the claimed invention as a whole would have been obvious. And so um, you look at Graham v. John Deere, you look at the four factors for obviousness, um, you look at the, uh, and, and that, of course, is out of the Supreme Court, you look at the Federal Circuit, how they've um, sort of uh, crafted the obviousness case law, um, and it, it's really, um, it is, is there some motivation for a person of ordinary skill to have um, taken teachings from the prior art and combined them in such a way as to achieve, achieve the claim invention with a reasonable expectation of success. Um, and uh, in contrast, obviously, type L patenting is purely a judicial, a judge-made common law construct. And, and the whole idea behind obviously type L patenting is um, that uh, an unjustified extension of patent term is not permitted. And so it is um, preventing an inventor, um, a single inventor or, a, or the same inventor, from getting the issuance of a separate set of claims in a, a second patent that are not patentably distinct. Um, from the claims of the first patent that was set forth in in Ray Leonardo in the Fed Circuit in '97, and so um, and, and and traces back before then, and so um, you know the, we we could probably have an entire webinar about the, uh, the the remaining differences of them, but really for obvious cycle patenting, you're looking at you know is there a claim that's not patently distinct um, that should um, prevent the patent owner from an unjustified extension of a patent term or or an unjustified additional portion of patent term versus um, what a person of ordinary skill had been motivated to go out there in the prior art and put together the, the claimed invention um, with a reasonable expectation of success, if you will, um, and, and would it have been obvious for that person to, to do so. All right. Thank you so much, Justin, for that uh, explanation of the difference between the two. Um, the last question here, um, I think we're pressing up against time. Last question here is from Matt. It says, what are some arguments that can be made to overcome a rejection using the combination of two or more references, like the patent owner based in Genus B and Gurin? Yeah, thanks, Emmanuel. Uh, I know we're pressed on time, so I'll try to answer this one quickly. Um, but yeah, so there's uh, there's a lot of different potential arguments you can make. Um, you know, one of the great great ones to make is you know, the obvious the standard requires uh, you know motivation to combine the teachings of the references uh, and there has to be a reasonable expectation of success so uh, a great way to do it is if you can find something in those those prior art references that are being cited against you see if there's anything that you know would, would discourage someone from from making the, the change that the patent challenger um, is alleging or you know whether there's anything uh, you can use to challenge that reasonable expectation of success I know in, in you know the type of cases we've been talking about today in the the chemical biotech uh, fields, um, you know the, these are, are are complicated fields um, where there's a, a, a very uh, low likelihood of success. It's it's very unpredictable. Uh, so really, kind of anything you can you can come out with that to to you know undercut any of those uh, motivations to combine reasonable expectation of success. Uh, we usually usually come up pretty good. All right. Thank you so much, Matt. And thank you to Matt and Justin for the presentation. Um, thank, thanks to everyone for attending today's webcast titled Recent IPR and District Court Litigations in the Life Sciences. This presentation that you just heard will be available on demand in the next week. So please look forward to an email from us with the access link. And this concludes our but this concludes today's Finnegan web webcast, and thank you everyone for attending. Have a good one.